explosions in the sky a poor man's memory. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting on over 750 stations on Pacifica and NPR and Low Power FM and college and community radio stations on public access TV and PBS TV stations in both TV satellite networks. Dish Network, Channel 9415 Free Speech TV, 9410 Link TV, and Direct TV, Channel 375. And we're video and audio podcasting at democracynow.org. Our headlines also available in Spanish for any radio station to take or for you to read at our website. I'm Amy Goodman. The Securities and Exchange Commission has admitted it missed repeated opportunities to discover what may be the largest financial fraud in history, a multi-billion dollar pyramid scheme operated by Wall Street legend Bernard Madoff. The SEC said it received credible allegations about the scheme at least nine years ago and will immediately open an internal investigation to examine why it had failed to pursue them. SEC Chair Christopher Cox said, quote, our initial findings have been deeply troubling. He also said the agency's inspector general would investigate whether personal relationships between Madoff's family and SEC staff played a role in the failed oversight. Bernard Madoff was the former chair of the Nasdaq Stock Exchange and a respected figure on Wall Street for nearly half a century. For decades, his firm, Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, had been one of the top market makers on Wall Street. In Washington, regulators had sought his advice on any number of regulatory issues over the years. In 2000, he served on a government committee established to protect investors by ensuring accurate and full public disclosure of information to them. In an old video of Madoff that's come to light, he tells an audience to tough to it's tough to skirt the law. Today's regulatory environment, it's virtually impossible to, to violate rules. I mean, this is something that the public really doesn't understand. And you, if you read things in the newspaper and you see somebody, you know, violate a rule, you say, well, you know, they're always doing this. But you, it's impossible for you to go under, for a violation to go undetected, certainly not for a, a considerable period of time. Investigators now accuse Bernard Madoff of doing just that. He was arrested at his home last week on fraud charges. According to court documents, Madoff said his money management business was a basically a giant Ponzi scheme, a type of fraud in which early investors are paid off from money of later investors until no more money can be raised and the scheme collapses. He estimated investors had lost as much as $50 billion. The fraud could be larger than the Enron scandal of 2001. Over the decades, Decades, Madoff steadily expanded his circle of investors, drawing in small individual investors, charities, pension funds, prominent billionaires, and European banks. Now, several nonprofits and foundations are being forced to close because their entire endowments have been wiped out. One victim is the New York based Jet Foundation, which was dedicated to electoral reform and improving criminal justice and human rights. Robert Crane is president of the Jet Foundation. He joins us here in our Firehouse studio. We're also joined by Paul. Kiel, a reporter from ProPublica, uh, which has been covering the Madoff scandal. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Paul, let's start with you. Explain uh, this whole—how this happened. Sure. Well, uh, well, they're still trying to figure out exactly how this happened. But essentially what it is, uh, Madoff had this big broker-dealer, which is a—it's a type of market-making. It's, it's not a particularly sexy kind of business. He had a, he had a room full of traders. But on an entirely separate floor, he had this investment advisory business, which he'd been running for decades. And year after year, he was able to give investors, you know, 10 percent, uh, like clockwork, these very consistent good returns. Um, and, you know, there were there was a number of suspicions from outside the firm, but uh, his investors were, were very happy with, with what able, he was able to deliver for them. Uh, and it seems to have all come crashing down, I think. It's pretty fair to say, as a result of the, of the recent financial crisis, you know the way a Ponzi scheme works is you uh, you take in, you know m money that's coming in and you pay out people who have been with you for a long time the returns that they're expecting, and usually what happens the way a Ponzi scheme will fall apart is all of a sudden you don't have that new money coming in to pay the people who who need their who need their money. You know investors get angry that you're not giving them their money. Eventually they go to the SEC or something like that, and the whole edifice comes crashing crashing down. Uh, in this case, he, he apparently uh, had investors asking for as much as seven billion, and uh, he apparently only had about 200 to 300 million left, which he. Uh, planned, apparently, to give to certain friends and family uh, as sort of the last-ditch thing he did before he turned himself in. 
but he confessed to his sons last Tuesday. His sons were uh, the, the two uh, senior executives below him. His, his brother also was an executive there. Uh, apparently, last Tuesday, he, he, you know, he confessed to them the whole thing. They said that they had no idea. Um, they eventually went to uh, the, the SEC and, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then on Thursday, the U.S. Attorney's Office showed up at his, his apartment and said, hey, we'd like to know if there's an innocent ex explanation for this. And he said, you know, I'm a complete fraud. This is, you know, he called it a giant Ponzi scheme. He said it's all one big lie. Uh, and so, you know, <laughs> that was that. And uh, what, how, could, how could his sons not know? I mean, how could his brother uh, not know? Theoretically, the parent, uh, what they say in the complaint is that he kept the, the books, you know, in a, in a, under lock and key. Uh, it was run on a completely different floor. There wasn't any overlap in terms of the people who worked for the sons and the broker dealer side of the business and, you know, his investment advisor business. I mean, of course, there are people who find that unbelievable that his sons who worked for him for 25 years, ever since they came out of college, didn't had no idea that this was going on. Talk about the early warnings, people who did try to blow the whistle or ask serious questions. Right. There was, there was a, a, an executive from a, from a rival investment uh, advising firm who, uh, as early as 1999, uh, wrote the SEC, I think, in Boston and New York repeatedly. Uh, in one of the 1999 letters, he actually did say this is the, you know, the world's biggest Ponzi scheme. Uh, and basically what he and others, uh, you know, investment advisors who had clients saying, you know, I'm thinking of investing in, in Bernie Madoff, uh, what they would do is they would look at, okay, he says that he has this certain strategy of how he's, he's, he's making his very consistent returns. And they would try to replicate that strategy or see, you know, is this possible that he's doing this? Uh, and they would say, like, they would look at it and they, they would say, no, it, it's, it's, there's no way that someone could, could have these sorts of returns in good times and bad, like clockwork. I mean, he even didn't really lose money this year, uh, you know, apparently. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this one investment advisor th apparently wrote the SEC consistently uh, from 1999 until as, as recently as this, this April, saying you got to look into this guy. Um, there is another case of an investment advisor whose, whose clients were thinking of investing in Madoff. And so he said, okay, let me take a look at it. He, he looked at his, you know, what he said his strategy was. He looked at his returns. He was very skeptical. He found out that um, he had this auditing firm. All these investment advisors have to have auditing firms. And he's like, well, I never heard of this auditing firm. And so he looked into it, and it was run out of a very small office in a place called New City, New York. It had three employees. One of the employees was apparently, you know, in his 70s. Uh, one was a secretary. Uh, and supposedly, this is the firm that's auditing uh, a firm that's, that's that's handling 17 billion, you know, however, you know, 25 billion dollars worth of assets, which is just incredible. Madoff was the former head of the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. Right. I mean, he was he was someone. I think Arthur Levitt, the former SEC chairman, said recently, you know, everybody knew this guy, who was established. Uh, he was he was sort of a fixture on Wall Street. Uh, it. it you know, it was sort of a, it was a perfect, perfect scam in that way, and that he he had this this public face that everyone you know he was trusted. He was sort of like, you know, one of the, the, the grandfathers of Wall Street at this point. The interrelationships with the Madoff family and the SEC. Could you explain what some of those are? Right. So apparently, uh, this came out uh, a couple of days ago, and and Christopher Cox confirmed this in a statement last night that uh, I believe it's it's Madoff's niece married. Uh, a, a man who worked in the SEC enforcement division. Eric Swanson. Right. Um, and what they say, though, is uh, he actually did, he was involved in one of the investigations of Madoff's firm. Uh, this was the broker dealer side, not the investment advisor side, uh, back in 2004, but that, um, you know, the romantic relationship, they didn't get married, I think, until 2007. Uh, so they're saying that. He that, had left the SEC. Right. By but then. Christopher Cox does say that, you know, we're going to look into this. You work for ProPublica. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's one of the organi uh, That's an organization that was uh, partly funded by Jet. Uh, right. We're joined right now by Robert Crane, who is the head of the Jet Foundation. J E H T. What does that stand for? Uh, justice, equality, human dignity, and tolerance. And talk about how you were funded and what's happened to you sure. now. Sure. Uh, we were funded by uh, uh, an individual family donors who. Uh, Unfortunately, had invested their their funds with uh, Mr. Madoff, and uh, they are, and and they are the uh, Jeannie Levy Church and Kenneth Levy Church, 
and uh, they, but it goes back be, before them. Their father before them was a close friend and, and uh, confidant of, of Mr. Madoff. And so uh, for the Levy churches, it was really, uh, I think, uh, this is doubly painful in many ways because it's also a betrayal of a history and a friendship and what they assumed was a, a friendship that, that went back over 30 years between uh, uh, her father and, and Mr. Madoff. And, and, uh, he was 